Good buddy to our OPB panel discussion. I'm Sean Shaheen. I'm one of the organizers of the conference, along with Yal Van Wagamat and Van Smaljok. So I'll first introduce uh, the panel and have each one of them say their institute and their role institute, roles in their institute, um, and then we'll start with some general questions. So Joe, do you want to begin? Um, I'm Joe Berry. I'm from the National Renewable Energy Lab down the road, and I work in the uh, Process Development and Advanced Concepts Group in the National Center for Photovoltaics. And obviously, I'm interested in all different kinds of PV and the basic uh, physics of of those devices. But I have a special affinity, and I've been working in the area of uh, organic photovoltaics for the last six years since I've been there. I'm Paul Byrne. I'm from the University of Queensland in Australia. I head up the Centre for Organic Photonics and Electronics, and that's a centre that has interest across a broad range of organic optoelectronic applications from OPV through to transistors, through to OLEDs, to sensors, and so on. Uh, the centre involves uh, chemists, material scientists, physicists, and engineers. And so we have the ability to develop new materials, um, characterise those materials, test those materials, both uh, from a fundamental point of view and also from device fabrication and, and testing. Um, I co-direct it with Paul Meredith, who's a good friend and internet matter physicist. Hi, I'm, my name is Moritz Rieder. I'm from the Institute of Applied Photophysics of the Technical University of Dresden. Um, I'm heading the, the group on organic solar cells, and we are mainly working there with vacuum processes, so sublimation of small molecules. And I've been working in the field of OPV now for 10 years, so it's scary. Better. <laughs> okay, my turn. Uh, my name is Kang Lee. I'm a, a research professor in the uh, Department of Material Science and Engineering. University of California, University of California, Los Angeles. Yeah, uh, I, my main research is on uh, polymer-based uh, solar cells. Uh, basically, about this to, to this with solution process, the uh, solar cells. Uh, so we work on polymer-based and also work on uh, small molecule-based uh, uh, solution process in that sense. So, and uh, we well, try to make a make different type of. Well, it's, it's mainly on, on devices. So. Uh, recently, that uh, tandem solution pro uh, solution process of tandem one of the research topic. I'm Nikos Kopinakis. I work at NREL at the Center for Chemical and Material Science. I've been at NREL uh, about ten years. I work in uh, Dyson's Dyson cells for a while, and the last um, six seven years I've been working on OPV and uh, mainly on uh, the interface photophysics and more of the basic properties of characterization of materials and uh, trying to understand photochemical dynamics and external dynamics. And, um, um, in being involved with the OPV program, which is more applied and developing materials and I'm in charge of the characterization of these materials as they transition from the synthesis lab to devices. Perfect. Well, welcome, everybody. So the first question is about tandem devices. And we're fortunate because we have two people associated with some of the record efficiencies in the world, uh, both in small molecule and polymer solution process tandem devices. So the question is a little bit aimed towards you guys, but of course everybody can, uh, can answer. So the question is, is it required that OPV advances as a tandem technology or even triple junction technology as opposed to just a single junction high efficiency device. And let me give you a, kind of a case study as an example, which is amorphous silicon. So amorphous silicon you know, was at a sort of 10 to 13% level, and uh, commercially it was attempted to make triple junction devices. There were several companies making triple junction devices. Obviously they didn't, they didn't work out. Um, so the question is, uh, is that relevant to OPV, and what is the pathway forward for OPV? So I open it up to the panel, sort of looking at the tandem uh, guys, but <coughs> anybody can answer. <laughs> Nobody wants that. <laughs> <laughs> well, perhaps I'll just kick things off then, and then you can tell me I'm, I'm wrong and go away. I mean, the, the, the big issue with tandem cells is to make sure that one cell is not parasitic on the second cell. Okay, so that is to say, um, one of the issues that we've seen in terms of the materials that people have presented is that the overlap of absorption of the different components is essentially, uh, you know, there's quite a bit of overlap. And that means, you know, if you're absorbing your light through one 
face of your tandem cell, then um, a certain amount of the light that could be used in the second cell is actually used by the first cell. And so you may not necessarily have a complete additive effect because you're actually using some of um, some, you know, you're using the energy from one of the cells which is parasitic on the second. And that's one of the big issues with, with tandem cells and how you deal with that, I think. So, probably not up to me to respond. Um, I don't think this is that much of an issue. Um, I'm not a chemist, but I think you can design organic materials that are pretty much complementary, but you don't necessarily have to make them complementary. In the tandem devices um, that we've published, there was still some overlap, but we still gained with respect to the single cell. And I think it all boils down is of how much extra can you get out for the effort you put in to get that extra. And there are various reasons for going to tandem devices. One is with complementary absorbers, if you really want to harvest different parts of the spectrum and get out better, a better or higher energy per electron hole pair for the blue light than you can get out for the red light. Um, but it, there might also be a reason for going to tandems or triple devices. If you have a good material that's absorbing pretty well, but you cannot make the absorbing layer thick enough, and that's when you start making too thin absorber cells and they can add up pretty well. So um, there are various reasons for going to tandem cells, and it will we'll see whether it um, the extra steps necessary for making the tandem device will um, be worth the extra efficiency you can gain. But if you look at the current efficiencies, um, tandems will always give you a higher efficiency than the single cells, or can have the potential for giving you higher efficiencies than the single cells. And with the current roadmap, we've seen some efficiency estimates for single heterojunction that range between 10 and 20 percent, or even higher, depending what what effects you take. Um, but we have to get in the module above 10 percent. We'll see whether that can be done with a single header junction. If it can be done, great. Um, but probably the safer bet at the moment is to aim for tandem devices. <coughs> I, like, uh, I like, like the most important factor for any cell is cost. And to bring to the market is the most important factor. Right? There's no point in doing research when you can't bring it to the market. So my question is Oh, that, I don't agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, well, I don't, I don't agree. I mean, at such a mass scale, I mean, to some extent, yes. I mean, although you say you don't agree, but I, I do agree with this thing. Because the most major force behind any technology is basically the uh, so, motivation, it's business, or... So I, I agree that at some point, somebody needs to make some money someplace, right? But yeah. I would argue that if you look at, say, the most um, kind of influential tech, technologies with respect to kind of integrated circuits and those kind of things, if we were just concerned about the, um, the application, right, um, then we, right, I mean, the computers that we have today are nothing more than a simple switch. I mean, fundamental, right? It's just that we have a lot of them. Yeah. And when we have a lot of them, they're very different than that single switch was. And so while I, on one level, you, you know, I'm playing a little bit of devil's advocate, I think that if we aren't concerned about the basic kind of, um, science of what we're doing, then we could end up in a situation where we don't actually have uh, a rationale for doing a lot of the materials that are represented here. I mean, so I would say that if you look at, say, organic photovoltaics in comparison to other thin film technologies, right, um, why is it we're interested in doing organics as opposed to just getting the price of silicon cheaper, if we take your rationale? So let me follow up. So at what point in the development chain should one consider cost? I mean, Paul, what if you're working on a polymer dendrimer with a very expensive catalyst? Do you say, oh, we're not even going to try this because it's, it's, it will never work? Um, <clears throat> well, again, you've got to think um, about what the domain cost drivers are. Actually, you know, if you think about how much material you require to cover a double-sized tennis court, uh, you need that about 20 grams. Okay, so, um, and you also have to think, uh, in terms of materials development, what people do in the pharmaceutical industry. So essentially you get people who um, work in a research lab, they come up with a complicated synthesis of something that works, 
They then take it and give it to the process chemists who actually turn into something that works, but in five steps as opposed to 25 steps, and the, the cost goes down. I think the bigger question is whether, given that there's so little material in, in, in one sense, whether there's, a, whether there's a good business model for a manufacturer of those materials. So if 20 grams covers double-sized tennis court, how many tonnes a year do you need to actually satisfy the, uh, the, 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 the use uh, nationally and internationally? Yeah. So, <clears throat> I mean, it's something you worry about if you're a manufacturer or if you want to actually bring it to market, but at least in my job, right, that's not my role, right? My role <laughs> is to do, is to make sure that I'm doing, um, asking the, the important basic science questions about whether or not I can get to kind of the efficiencies Right, that one would like to obtain, right? And then I'll let somebody else worry about the cost modeling. Not that you know I'm completely devoid of that, but quite honestly, if it's an interesting scientific question, even if it's with a material that is not you know, directly trans translatable to a, a manufacturing process, and that's okay. I mean, look at CZTS, right? I mean, that's from hydrazine. Now, I don't know very many people that want to basically make a hydrazine-based production line, but that doesn't mean that that fundamental scientific result wasn't interesting. Yeah, well, I'll add a little bit on that. So, uh, the, 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 uh, for, for any new, <coughs> new science or technology, the, the development uh, has different stages. And uh, um, if you think the material, for uh, give you an example, that's, uh, okay, um, today I think the speaker talked about the PDB technology from Solomon, that's where, where I worked before. And that polymer, if you take a look of uh, the, the initial publication out, and a diehard uh, chemist look at the things that's wrote. They will say that, okay, this one will never work. Yeah. Okay, the, the things that wrote is too complex, and you use whatever your catalyst, maybe whatever, is toxic or whatever, those things. But if that's, that's, that's just a starting point of your research. The, the, the follow-on research, then the chemist will find a way, should find a way to find, the, okay, how can I get a, alternative route to make it simple and that, that's an important part of the science that will, will go on and uh, uh, then that's become the second step and if you think about these things later you want it to go to go, go to market or something it's it's not a university or tiny companies that's doing that part of work and you will have like Merck you have BSF you have <coughs> Sumitomo or Mitsubishi, those kind of companies, right? They have tons of uh, know-hows on uh, scale up. And those uh, know-hows, that's uh, what uh, we can, we need to prove something, say, that's an efficiency part to a certain level, then they start to have interest in it. And at that part, uh, when, when that uh, majority of company, uh, large company that has more interest in it, uh, th that's an important step for, for the technology too. Okay. I guess the other point is that at some point, you, there won't be the hundreds of polymers or small molecules that are produced in the scientific literature. There'll be a small number of proprietary materials that will, that in principle, have the properties that you need, and so they'll be the ones that are made. And then, of course, the, the cost drivers change completely. But um, uh, in defense of the chemists, I would say that always attacking the chemists, ch chemists <laughs> always have the eye on the prize. You know, chemists don't go out to make the most complicated thing by the most complicated route. Um, although expensive, difficult science, of course, is the best science to do because it takes a long time and it takes you through your career towards retirement. So you just remember that. Um, but um, plus, you can't be scooped as easily. <laughs> so, so you know, you know, when you're designing something, you do need to think about you know what is the simplest route, what's the most effective route, what's the most cost effective route to do that. At any rate, that may not be the best route in the end, but it's certainly uh, the way that you, you, you eventually get there. Yeah, and I think if you, the cost of the material is not the only part in the equation, yeah. because you have to be able to process the material with the, with the processes you have at hand, with reliable processes. So if, if, you, uh, if a material gives you the best efficiency, but it's very subtle to handle, and very difficult and only under very narrow parameters to produce gives you the efficiency and the lifetime you expect, then this may not be the right material to go to. So it doesn't mean that, of course you're aiming for getting your record material into production, but on the way there, there are many other things you need to consider. And cost of the material is probably only one. Uh, producibility, reproducibility, 
lifetime, they all go into the equation. And this is something at an early stage of the research you should have an eye on, saying, okay, what has or what is possible in principle, but um, it's not something you should immediately stop working on because um, some people tell you it will never work. I actually add a little bit on various uh, thing about uh, the, the CZTS. You, you, you mentioned the, you, you mentioned hydrazine, okay, the processing part of thing. And uh, the, the other part actually, if you look to, uh, take a look of the face diagram, <laughs> yeah. yeah. What's your well, window? No. So there, there are other reasons to not like CZTS. <laughs> <laughs> Earth-abundant elements, 10% efficiency. Question here. Uh, speaking about cost and lifetime, since uh, organics have a, a lower cost and a lower lifetime, but uh, compare it to the standard silicon solar cell, which can go and we can put it on the rooftop for about 25 years, if, depending on the lifetime. But the advantage of organics is that they're flexible and can go to any substrate. Just a thought here, like since the lifetime is uh, short and the cost is also low, so if we have we put it on a flexible substrate and the lifetime is say around five years. So since the cost of production is maybe low, so after five years, what if we remove that and put in a new one? So it can go on and on. So I, I believe I just there, the argument on that. I believe there are companies that have that business model. I've seen calculations in literature as well exactly doing that. <coughs> Although, to be taken seriously by the established industry, I think they would probably say five year lifetimes. Yeah. But well, but you've got to take a step back. I mean, yeah. are, you, are you going to compete with the solar fields in Spain? Um, you know, not in the next few years. <laughs> well, or, or ever. I mean, is that where. Well, organic photovoltaics is going to be. Well, there's also the dirty little secret of like the inorganics as well. I mean, if you look at, say, CADTEL or uh, CIGS on flexible, right, all of a sudden those, you know, they don't last so long either, right? The, you know, the metallization and the contact issues, uh, those, those, those aren't any more robust in some sense, right? So um, if you're looking at a flexible application, you know, maybe you've got to live with a five-year lifetime. Right, unless you want to spend a lot of money on you know, whatever it is your substrate is. But you've also got to think about your consumer as well. <coughs> now, is, is the consumer going to go out and buy something for five years yeah. and then it's up on your roof, can you be bothered it doesn't work anymore? Well, well, Another time people do it with cars. Yeah. <laughs> just saying. Perhaps in America. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, but <laughs> mobile phones. Yeah, I, I think of, um, uh, I believe that organic, uh, organic, uh, um, uh, one, one very big uh, thing to the live there is always uh, it's uh, uh, versatile. It's uh, it provides the opportunity. I mean, we talk about the flexible. Okay, that's one thing. And then uh, the, the, there is you, you you could have however if you think that uh, you could have uh, rigid things that have uh, application too. Uh, I mean, uh, transparency will be uh, transparent. So, type of solar cell I think is very kind of promising in the sense that uh, you probably will not really have other competitors wi with you on that. I mean, uh, a group uh, that's a uh, young group in UCLA that uh, we just uh, said make the, it's, a, it's actually a carry on that uh, started from the, the, the tandem, tandem, material developed for tandem, just like uh, uh, Paul said that uh, you don't want the overlap or something, so we developed those low band polymer. Those things <coughs> seems like uh, they, they, they basically have absorption, have a gap in between of the visible. And because of that part, they tell you, okay, if I do not absorb this visible part, that I have something that's visible, they're very transparent. But this, this uh, uh, IR part, uh, near IR part, give me a, give me a not, uh, nice solar cell performance, actually, between 4 to 5%. If you think of uh, uh, something that's uh, really very transparent and you get 4 to 5%, well, it, we might still have, have lots of room to do. And you can make it uh, rigid, and the, the encapsulation is, becomes uh, uh, rigid encapsulation in, uh, will have longer lifetime in that, right? So, so that part, we might have some prediction in, uh, in, in Windows applications. You think either, either the building or you have the car. There's so many people that we have the car, the sun is too strong, we, we have the tinted glass, right? Tinted glass, like uh, uh, 30% or something, 
uh, you know, a little bit darker there. And, and in, in fact, the, the, the transparent solar cell, the, that's a complete one, from your substrate to all the electrode material, whatever, together. Those are in, in the uh, transparency in the sem around 70% uh, part, invisible between 50% to 70%. I think that that's, a, that's a, a, an, an example of what you can expect for organic uh, solar cells to provide uh, the, this kind of uh, applications. So, so one thing that I remember especially keenly, and I think it, it feeds into what, what he was just saying, is that, um, so I was at a, an OLED workshop, because you know, we worked on contact materials, we, we worked on contact materials for OLEDs, and one of the guys from Kodak said, you know, the thing that really caused that company to have financial issues wasn't, you know, I mean, okay, there's the whole digital revolution and everything, but was the fact that they viewed their mission to basically develop film that faithfully reproduced whatever it was that came through the aperture on the camera. And Fuji basically had saturating colors, right? And all the people at Kodak thought these saturating colors, that's a disaster, right? That's not what film is supposed to do. But consumers loved it, right? You know, their memories were vibrant and captured on film. I mean, and, you know, this guy telling me that made me really kind of appreciate the fact that, you know, what people will buy is, a, I mean, it's kind of an important thing at some point, right? Um, but, I mean, this discussion is, I guess, motivated uh, from the question is as to, you know, where is OPV going? And this time then is really the, the answer for OPV commercialization, and it could be. But on the one hand, I, I think that the we haven't really explored all the options of single junction devices, and this, this, this doesn't mean to say that we should abolish standards and go back to single junctions because they're simpler. Uh, but we haven't really explored all the options in terms of ideas like energy relay dyes and the like that people have been exploring with dye cells with quite some success lately, uh, or sub gap absorption, etc., to extend the, the band gap without losing voltage, etc. So um, that's one thing, I guess, but um, if I had to answer the question as to what does OPV need right now to move forward and be more convincing towards conventional technologies like silicon and things is, um, is mean modules of high efficiency. And so, you know, scaling up the area uh, and not necessarily in the tandem, but, you know, so show me the modules that approach the, the small scale lab efficiencies of the 10%, that's really what what will give OPV, uh, you know, uh, injection of light, for example. That, that's a good point, and we've seen <coughs> very little, little proof of principle on this scale up, right, while retaining efficiency. Yeah. Well, I think that's the Perhaps Helio Tech. Um, yeah. has some data. Um, they will probably show them at some point, and probably have shown them already at some conferences, but they're definitely working on modules and on tandem yeah. modules, and. If you want to go out at the moment, then I would say the best bet is to go in terms of efficiency and go with tandems. Um, we'll see. They still have to get up their plant up and running. Um, so, so tandems have a small advantage in scale up, at least on the issue of series resistance, right? Because the current, current is less. Exactly. Right. So you but, can. <coughs> I mean, just sort of getting back to the, the tandem question, I think there's a different question for small molecule evaporated devices versus tandem cells versus um, solution process tandem. You know, I think it's much I, I think it's much easier to make multi-layered structures out of small molecules via, via evaporation. Much, much easier. With, with um, control thicknesses. With control thicknesses. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and, and, and so if there are tandems, you know, they're the tandems that are likely to make it ahead of the solution process, because it's a much simpler process. Okay. Um, along the lines, as we had the discussion earlier, if you turn it around, the customer probably doesn't care whether he has a single header junction <laughs> or a, a whatever um, generates the efficiency or the electricity out of his, his okay. slab he puts into 
people like two for the price of one. <laughs> well, you well, get one solar cell and you get one free. Or maybe someone from IndiaTech is watching what I'm saying. Um, <laughs> they are. <laughs> um, but I think one thing we should ne not forget is that the organic photovoltaics open up completely new fields. Where at the beginning, um, costs are important, but not as important as in the power market as you really aim for every, every cent you can get lower per kilowatt hour. But the added value of having a flexible or semi-transparent device um, in a facade element or in an outdoor equipment um, that may justify a few extra cents for, for the module. And I think the whole, whole technology still is in the early age, the stage and still has to prove more probably to the investors than to the final customers at the moment to really get on the learning curve and get the experience of making the devices. So as you said, the first material might be quite expensive and people say you will never be able to scale it up. Then you give it to someone who has processing experience and they <coughs> make it in larger amounts with fewer steps. So I think this is what, independent of technology, where I think the next step of OPV Does does everybody, does everybody understand why it is that efficiency is so important to whatever the cost model <coughs> looks like? Is that something that's been discussed? Generally, earlier discussions on the first day of the workshop, okay. not specific OPV potentially. Yeah, yeah, but generally, right? I mean, efficiency makes the you know the, the expense that is associated with the rest of the things become less. Well, essentially. dollar per watt is yeah. the watt on the bottom. So. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah same, same for uh, the question of the tandem versus the uh, single junction. Uh, it, it's still uh, too early to tell. Uh, my personal feeling is, uh, I mean. No, no, it's generally say, uh, it's believed that the tandem will give uh, higher efficiency. Probably if you go take, we, we take uh, what the, the prediction from uh, Tanaka before that uh, single junction if it is 10 under the same kind of condition, the tandem might give you 15%. And then later it's really dependent on, on uh, I mean, what the consumer is willing to buy. I mean, they might want to buy different uh, materials if there is a niche market for for single junction, then single junction makes sense. If it if, if, uh, turns out that the efficiency becomes such a uh, such a limiting factor, then we probably have to go to go to time. Uh, well, I, I think at this stage we, we, we need to leave this uh, open. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it strikes me that, I mean, so thermodynamically, right, I mean, if you have a single, I mean, thermodynamically tandems have to, have to basically make sense, right? But the question is whether or not some of the more exotic kind of modes of operation or basically photoconversion photo can be done in kind of a single junction geometry. I mean, to me, that's the question, right? Because at the end of the day, right, if you look at the SQ limit for these things, right, and if efficiency is an important driver, then more junctions is better, all other things staying equal. Now, keeping all other things equal is not a trivial statement, but if that can be done, then tandems have to make sense. Let me go back to Paul's statement, if I remember correctly, that uh, vacuum deposition is clearly easier for multi-junction than solution processing. Guy, do you agree with that statement? Well, um, if from the film formation evaporation from the sequence, I think it's a, it's a fair statement. On the other hand, I would, I would kind of argue that uh, in, in tandem, uh, in solution-based uh, tandem solar cells, you actually get, uh, I, I think uh, uh, the, the device structure is still much more simpler in, than, than in, in small molecule. Uh, so uh, again, I, I, I don't want to, I, I, I don't want to say that uh, at this stage, uh, which one is better or something, that, that's, a, that's a big uh, option. Open yeah, but Sean, once you, <laughs> 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 you raise the point, <laughs> 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 I will get it next. <laughs> So we can take an analogous step in, 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 into the field of OLEDs. Mm -hmm. So in terms of commercial OLEDs, are they, you know, the ones in your Samsung Galaxy 2, mm -hmm. the one in your television, are they small molecule evaporator devices or are they solution process devices? Right now they're small molecule. Yeah. I think you can evaporate I think, I think there, there is also a question that's uh, related uh, to the the cost issue. I think uh, OLED, OLED display in display, you, you still have a, a 
uh, uh, quite a big, uh, uh, large, um, how to say, your, your profit margin related to that. And the, in PV part of that, so we probably do not have that much luxury. Uh, so um, again, that's a, uh, th th there are lots of things that I need to consider. It's yeah, but Dallas, I mean, and, and there, are, there are companies that are keen to use, I mean, solution process routes to, to those displays as well, right? I mean, Dow is developing a process, I know, um, that they've... Well, the, the, the biggest holder of intellectual property is actually Sumitomo Chemical Company. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so, so. Um, so, but they're not yeah. in market yet. Now, I'm a great fan of solution pressing. I've been working on conjugated polymers and dendromers, all solution pressing for, for a long time. So, you know, I'm just sort of throwing that out there as, you know, that is the competitive activity, you know, and there is a competition between these two technologies, you know, um, solution processing versus evaporation. And, uh, and I actually don't mind which wins in the end, um, as, long as, as long as one actually makes it to the end. And if Don's they point, Sorry, Don's point is valid, right? This is what, 50 square centimetres or, or yeah. less, and costs several hundred dollars. You know, right. and for photo text, this will not work. Right? <laughs> yeah, but the main cost driver in, in, in an OLED display is not the OLED material. It's actually the, uh, the drivers. Sure. Yeah. That is actually the back So yeah. in terms of the same costs for covering a unit area, um, it's probably not greatly different. Okay. Okay. Now, there is iridium in, 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 in those, uh, I would say, and probably the green and the red. Um, but they're really complexes. They'll be guest host systems. That'll be a small percentage. And so, you know, I, I think you've got to be you know, a little bit careful uh, about uh, dismissing that. And probably vacuum processing or can be cheap. Um, in terms of processing, I think it pretty much boils down. I had a discussion with Christoph Brabitz a few years back. Is you have to just to be able to produce fast enough. And then it doesn't matter whether it's a printing machine or a vacuum machine. And as I said, there are vacuum processes that are really, really fast. And so it depends on the throughput. And in the end, both processes will be probably limited by material cost, encapsulation cost, yeah. and then other factors like lifetime and efficiency immediately come back in. And then it's an open question. Um, but in terms of lifetime, I would say Heletic is pretty good, doing pretty well with the evaporated molecules and the stacks they have. Doesn't rule out that there will be polymers with similar solution processed. Well, solution processed doesn't um, exclude small molecules. Let's okay. say that too. from the uh, beginning that um, there may be solution processed small molecule devices or poly solution processed polymer devices that are as stable and as efficient as a small molecule one evaporated. So we'll see. Uh, but then uh, there's a the question, when is a small molecule a small molecule? <laughs> <laughs> I want to go to the audience first. Right? You, had a, you had a question earlier. Can it a totally general question? Um, okay. How do you see the energy problem in the background of human habits? So is it more likely that we solve it by development of more and more technology to produce more energy, or would we rather find more possibilities to save it? Or maybe by changing our lifestyle, and what kind of policies could be helpful? Very bright question. Who wants to go first? <laughs> so, <laughs> as as with all as with all things, I mean, um, education is, is is key to it, and um, you know, I think sort of um, uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps this is going to be an ageist comment. But you know there are certain generations for which this is lost, okay, and so um, we have to think about how we educate um, our children and, and young people about the whole issue to do with energy and, uh, and and so on. And you know part of that education is actually getting to realise that we can't actually continue um, with the quality of life that we currently have if we continue to burn fossil fuels, okay. And, um, and that quality of life, of course, is not just you know, driving your car up and down and flying to nice um, summer schools and things like that. Um, medicines, most medicines actually come out of the oil industry. So you burn it, then there's nothing left. Most renewable energies will require some form of fossil fuel-based starting materials. For example, small <coughs> molecules, conjugated polymers. Um, the, the, the grease that probably um, oils, uh, you know, the grease that 
does the bearings in um, you know, the, uh, the, the wind generators and so on. So you know, there, there's this question about how do we use what we still have left <coughs> in a sensible way and effectively you know, stretch that out. And the first stage of that is, is, is education. I'm not a great fan of the big stick. Um, that is to say, you know, we're going to tax you to death um, because that then just gets people aggravated and annoyed and so on. Whereas if they actually start thinking, well, you know, these are my options and there are options there, then um, people will actually start start doing that. So, so I tend to think that people basically respond to, to costs, right? I, I mean, basically, it, and, and the question basically comes down to what is the cost of doing what it is you're doing? Right? If I drive to work every day, guess what? You know, my gas prices are more or less subsidized. Right? I don't have to pay for what happens after the stuff gets burning out of my tailpipe. If I did have to pay for that, then at least I would be, you know, I would be on equal footing with whatever the, the alternative energy um, provided is. Right? So I tend to think of it in terms of, so while I agree that education is important in the sense that Right, I mean, the kids these days recycle a lot more kind of religiously than, um, you know, people of my parents' generation uh, might, for example. And um, so, so I think there's an important component to that, but I think at the same time that when we, when we don't pay for all the costs of the things that we do, we skew basically our perception and the landscape of what we think things cost, right? So this notion that, for example, PV has got a compete with what it costs to burn coal. I mean, on the one hand, I can appreciate, you know, where people are coming from, but on the other, the other part of me thinks that that's completely irresponsible because once you've burned the coal, right, okay, it also contains, say, cadmium and all these other heavy metals. You basically put that into the atmosphere. <coughs> that comes down someplace. Somebody inhales that. Somebody's paying for that somewhere, right? I mean... So let me, let me raise a very salient uh, part of the issue would be drive range on electric cars. Right? If we could get electric cars to maybe 150 miles, you know, 220 kilometers, people would need to change their habits a little bit. Do you think people would do that? Would they accept that? But hang on. I mean, this is, this is almost a middle class, upper class, lower class question. All right? Because if you think about American society, and it's the same in Australian society, it's actually built around out-of-town shopping malls. Mm -hmm. All right? So um, if, you, you know, if, if you don't have the village shop, if you like, how are people going to to, to, to to actually live in the society as it's gr currently grown up? Okay, so to, you know, if you if you start saying, well, actually, we'll just put the fuel price up and I won't do quite so much, there is a level of society that can't even afford that electric cars. Great idea, get the mileage up, but they're not going to be cheap. So in the side, you still have to, you know, you, you have to you have to be able to cater not just for the middle and upper class, people who can afford these things, you've got to think about those people who can't afford them and ensure that they actually have a quality of life that's, you know, that, that, that's, that's good as well. There's a term co coined energy poverty, yeah. because the uh, costs for energy are going up and it will get expensive and probably it will incorporate then all the damages that are done put them, slap them on the oil pro the gas price or whatsoever. But, um, yeah, because I would, I would say from that perspective, right, I mean, you're, I mean, so what you're basically advocating for is instead of, say, paying, say, an additional cost in terms of the fuel directly, right, because that would, you know, economically disadvantaged folks would be kind of put under the kibosh of that kind of regime based upon your argument that you should, in fact, tax those who are, who can afford it, basically, at the, at the back end to basically subsidize those things, right? I mean, that's... Subsidize what things? Uh, subsidize renewables or subsidize electric vehicles, for example, right? So instead of basically taking it out as, as a use kind of fee, right, which is kind of, you know, would I as a rational kind of, like, at least hope as a rational actor in the marketplace, I go out and I say, okay, well, how much does it cost me to do gas? How much does it cost me to take the bus? How much does it cost me to run gas fuel? Uh, how much would it cost me to basically convert over to, you know, solar power or, or, mm -hmm. or whatnot? But if, if basically making me act rationally, right, um, because of the prices is, uh, is objectionable because of the economic disparities, then the counter argument would be go ahead and tax those that can afford it so that you can subsidize um, the people who want to basically participate in those markets, right? So, I mean, it 
It's got to be one or the other, it seems to me. We could spend less on defense. Well, <laughs> actually, it's interesting. No, that's true. That's true. But it's actually interesting, right, that the military is one of the most rational actors with respect to basically energy costs because it really does cost them directly to run, right? I mean, if you're, if you're at war someplace and you need fuel for your vehicle, guess what? You've got to get it there. Right? And so therefore, you are paying all those costs in the supply chain. So they're actually very keenly aware of it, ironically. In, in fact, the Army and the Marines are investing heavily in, in and, solar energy. And, and, and working with them well. And electric vehicles. For that matter. On, on the flip side of the economic issue, um, in Sub-Saharan Africa, there's a serious effort to bring electrification via solar energy to villages who have no power. So in that sense, solar can come in the bottom of the economic scale and help bring up from the bottom. It's the most economical solution. Of course, the alternative is lodging around fuel for <coughs> miles and miles of batteries. So the basic needs um, <coughs> seem to be light for reading and music. And radio runs on batteries. But with cooking. Soap, cooking, you can done do with direct radiation, yeah. But, um, Solar, or uh, cell phones too. Cell phones, charging cell phones. So, yes. But it is, it is interesting. You know, we often talk about CO2 emissions in the first and second world, but actually there's enormous CO2 emission in the third world because, if they, because they still cook on kerosene, they still cook with wood. And um, if you think about you know, what a, you know, sort of a kilo of kerosene chucks out in terms of CO2, um, that's actually a significant amount of CO2 as well. So. It's a global problem. Um, we probably are more um, profligate with the way we do it in most things, in some respects. But it, it, it's a problem across this, this whole, uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a world problem, basically. Um, so things like solar power lights that they can have and, um, and, and recharges and things like that, it's brilliant. I mean, some of those um, uh, things that I've seen recently uh, Oh, it's, it's really good. And I think 819 is He's doing ma making thing. his business model or part of his business model is to have those solar chargers. Mm. Um, That's right. Yeah, the policy question is hard. I mean, it's hard because because whenever you deal with people, right, you, have, you have a whole host of you know different wants, uh, and I will say wants. I won't say needs. <laughs> That's why we all focus on the uh, efficiency side of the equation. Yeah, my, my dad got his PhD in political science. You wouldn't catch me doing that. <laughs> but I think policy relies on vision in politicians. And, um, you know, it's in certain countries, I mean, within Australia, for example, um, the rotation of government happens every three years. And so, in essence, it's very difficult for a government to have that vision to push something through because if it's something that's viewed as important and necessary but extremely unpopular, then they know they're going to get hammered in the next election and so, you know, put some bit of a problem there. Nikos, do you have a perspective on that? Yeah, I mean, look <laughs> <laughs> no, you've got to have a government yeah. to have a perspective. <laughs> I'm, I'm from Greece. <laughs> so, so look at, you know, what, what was in the mass media Two years ago, three years ago, about this debate about carbon taxes all around the world. And I, I was in Australia when that law was passed last year, and there was nothing in the news all weekend about the carbon tax. And there was the debate in this country two or three years ago whether we should do this or not. And then um, around the same time, gasoline was up to four dollars a gallon, which will make every European laugh. But here it was more expensive. It's a big deal, right? You know, it used to be two dollars a gallon to the nineties, as I understand it. So, um, and it was all about renewable energy, etc. But then uh, it kind of faded away because of the economic crisis, and now it's all about whether the euro will survive or not. And if some major politician starts talking about energy and renewables, they'll be accused of uh, diverting, uh, diverting the interest of the public from the main important things, which is the economy and jobs. Uh, so it's, it's a hard problem. I mean, it's, it's really a hard problem. And uh, it, I mean, for example, in Europe, there's a lot of debate whether the southern countries are in trouble, should be 
using renewable energy as a way to grow out of the issues. I mean, you know, Greece has a lot of sunshine, so there's a lot of investment in that type of thing. So that's, I guess, in part, that will in part help. Uh, now, how major is going to be in terms of, uh, you know, funding restrictions that are everywhere nowadays? Who can tell? Of course, there's a school of thought that renewable energy can drive the economy forward. <coughs> We're going to hear, hear from Governor Bill Ritter about the new energy economy. At some point it will, because there will come a time where renewable energy will be the only thing available. So whoever has access to it will survive. Whoever I mean, has so Greece is low position. Yeah. <laughs> but in a hundred years, Greece will be I, I think actually Paul's point about, right, I mean, so oil is a valuable resource, not just for burning, right? I mean, it is the seed material for a lot of, I mean, for plastics, right? And we're talking about plastic solar cells, right? I mean... There's some irony in there, I believe. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but the thing is, when we, when we talk about the chemical industry, th that volume, <laughs> compared to that, that's uh, what you need uh, in small molecules or polymers. Yeah, it's small. Tiny. <laughs> that's tiny. true. Right. Yeah. In terms of renewable, many people say that time of cheap energy is over, but I think in terms of the cost development and the potential of renewable, I think the time of cheap energy is still to come. So. We just have to get there and have to get there fast, so, such that it's still worth it. We also have to remember that our current electricity supply is heavily subsidised. I mean, we don't pay for, you know, we haven't really paid for the infrastructure for all the wires, the everything else. So, you know, we've had it pretty cheap for a long time, basically. Yeah. Um, I mean, the thing that I wonder about, you know, is, is all these natural gas wells, right? I mean, how many people would prefer to have, you know, a set of so a field of solar panels in your backyard versus a, I mean, a, you know, natural gas rig. I love a natural gas rig in my backyard. No, no, no. I think, but you know, it would be rich. Sure. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I think I'm taking. Ass ass <laughs> assuming, assuming you don't get the profit from it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, put that way. <laughs> Well, perhaps on that note, um, we should wrap up the uh, discussion. It's 8 o'clock. So, um, you didn't ask us about Kanaka. Yeah. I, I did not. Um, if you care to, um, if you're interested, we could keep going for a little bit. So, Okay, I'll ask the question. <laughs> <laughs> what is the impact on the overall OPV field of Kanaka having gone bankrupt? Is it devastating, mild annoyance, somewhere in between? <clears throat> okay. Um, since I'm the least device person I'll probably take the first stab at this. And I think we don't know yet. In my personal opinion. We'll see. And that comes from the, um, from uh, doing research in this country and seeing how uh, especially several of our funding sources over here have always an eye out there as to is anybody going to manufacture what they're working on. And are they going to manufacture it here, or are they going to manufacture it somewhere, some other country? And in that sense, Konarka was the major player. Um, and it's, I think it's too early to say from <coughs> our standpoint. Now, that said, Konarka has not really, has not really disappeared. As I understand it, they, they're looking for a buyer, and they may still be, be around under some capacity or under a different name. So it's not, given that Konarka has gone entirely under, we may see them come back, uh, but in any event, we're going to have to wait and see what's going on, what, what happens. There is a large party of IP, obviously, that's yeah. associated with Kanaka. That's right. But I mean, it's the problem with all these small startup companies on complex technologies. Um, I mean, you know, and uh, the same thing was, was seen, seen with OLEDs. You know, there were small startup companies. Um, some of those small startup companies are now being bought by companies that actually make other things and make profits and can invest back into that development. And there's a point at which, you know, your investors, if you like, your venture capitalists, if enough of these companies go under, they'll get cold feet and they'll, and they'll just go away. And I think, you know, you have to be very careful as a community not to oversell your technology, right? And Kanaka, I think, is a problem um, because it was seen as one of the flagship startups in organic photovoltaics. Um, I have to say that I think Helia Tech has now got some great responsibility on their shoulders because in terms of uh, the technology, in terms of efficiency, lifetimes, etc., 
they're, they're, they're you know, right up there leading, leading the pack. And if Heliotech were to go under, we would then have a um, solution process company gone under, a, um, uh, an evaporated technical company gone under, um, and I think the investors at that point would probably go, you know, this is all too difficult, it's going to be too expensive, and silicon by that stage has actually become uh, below a dollar a watt, and um, it's all over Red Rover. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, you, we have to be realistic about this. I mean, silicon's good. Yeah, but so, in that sense, silicon, I mean, silicon's, I mean, how are you going to beat silicon, right? I mean, if you're really concerned about silicon, I mean, is there any hope? Right, I mean, the, you know, the, the path or the, the long history of people who are going to supersede or supplant uh, silicon is long and distinguished and all failed, right? Um, I would argue that that's not the thing we're looking for with OPV anyway, right? Well, we're really looking for some diversity in terms of what the technology mix is, and that's required, and that that will exist <coughs> irrespective of how well any one particular technology does. I would, I would say it's not even just organics, it's also other thin film technologies, right? Um, you know. Well, what's happened with silicon has been tremendous, and I think yeah. we're all happy about it. Uh, the question is, can silicon get you to terawatt levels? It's the most abundant element on the planet. Um, <laughs> having said that, right, I work with a large number of people who would argue that if you were going to pick one material to make a solar cell out of, it would not be silicon, <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, it they has, so great. right? But, but that's the thing with silicon, right? We know so much about it that we can engineer our way around it. And I would actually argue, um, as somebody who works in kind of other novel thin films, or abundant thin film kind of materials, that one of the things that um, I find appealing about organics is the design flexibilities that, that the chemists bring to it and the ability to do that design at relatively low cost, right? Most inorganic systems that are worth anything in terms of a device application, we know a lot about them, right? And so if you have a material that, that's an inorganic that you want to take to an application, it better be good for more than one thing, right? If you're gonna spend all that time. If you look at the transparent contact materials, they're good for a lot of things. You look at three fives, two six compound semiconductors, they're good for a lot of different devices, right? If you want to engineer a material for, sil for, for solar, then it seems to me that the organics offer you the design flexibility and, and kind of um, uh, relative breadth of possibilities that you don't find happening so easily in, in, in inorganic systems. So design flexibility. Yeah. The chemists aren't so bad after all. Yeah. <laughs> I'm married to one, so I guess it works out. It's not me. No, no. <laughs> Any other comments on the Kanarka industry? Yeah, probably has hurt the whole field to some extent, no matter whether you're solution processing or doing vacuum processing. Um, you will, the first thing you have to do is to get your process up and running, and then the uh, judgment is out for the cost you can do the process at. So it's a hurdle. Heliotech still has to take, um, although I think vacuum processing is easier to translate to a large, larger scale than solution processing. And I think Heliotech stands pretty good chances to actually do this and get the process up and running. But what's happening outside in the field and going two years back, nobody would have expected silicon prices dropping that fast. Um, we will see how the competition develops. As I said, there are niche applications or even larger applications where OPV has unique properties. You again mentioned the, the versatility of the organic materials that immediately translates into colors, making solar cell any, any color you like, making them semi-transparent and so on. Um, and we'll see to what, what scale this field can actually grow. But um, are there are also some advantages in terms of index, right? I mean, like these studies, for example, of how much power is and the low light level performance, right? Um, you know, yeah. that are potential advantages as well. They have, a, they have a good harvesting factor over the day. So there, there are a couple of, of advantages and 
I mean, it, it's not clear to me that, I mean, I guess if Kanarka had failed in kind of a, a more kind of fundamental catastrophic way, I would be more concerned about it, right? But they failed as a business, right? Not as so much as a technology, at least from, from my perspective. I mean, they had product. They didn't have enough product and they weren't producing it at, you know, as cost effectively as they needed to, right? Which again points to the, I mean, look, you know, I think I'm a pretty smart guy, but I also know that if I were, if I were to come up with something that I thought could be a product, I would be looking for somebody who's got experience on how to get a product out the door, right? I mean, um, and it's, and with some of the other um, organic optoelectronic companies, I mean, that's what they've done, that's how they've stayed in business. Um, my understanding is that that wasn't the case with Canarca, so I have less worries about them in that sense. And the fact that we lost two of our staff members to another organic photovoltaic startup says that maybe <laughs> it's not all lost. <laughs> you know, that, that's a good point. It was a, it was a business model failing or an economic failure, not a science yeah. failure. Yeah, well, uh, I think uh, failure, of course, it's a, it's a, it's a sad thing. I think that immediately it, it should matter, uh, in, impact the, the, the federal funding to encourage researchers. But uh, I think <coughs> there are two phases. I mean, uh, yeah, as, uh, uh, if uh, say we're still not too sure whether this failure is a is a uh, advantage in the chances for other people to more people to go to into this field or not. I mean, uh, many times that if you want to go to a field that you you check the IP, see if you have a, a, a dominant IP player somewhere there. You, you don't know whether you want to go into it. And uh, on the other hand, Kanaka, uh, Kanaka, I mean, Kanaka doing a good job in, in manufacture, not good enough so far, I mean, but uh, I think uh, that uh, uh, still, that if you look at the, the, the field, Kanaka is not the, the dominant one uh, pushing the technology forward yet. We see lots of uh, many, many players there and many, many new concepts, many, many, um, New materials coming out. Uh, that's a new, new efficiency, new process. Uh, I think that there are plenty of chances to, to to go to go there. On the other hand, I think uh, a little bit disagree with, with uh, Maurice. I, I think that the uh, solution process that go in large area is not really a problem. <laughs> <laughs> well, translating it from maps into large areas, I think what cost Konaka a lot of, or caused a lot of headaches to Konaka. I don't mean that it's not possible. And I, if you look at what's happening in the printing industry, they managed to print several, I think the record is, I think, 12 bed layers on top of each other and still get a product out. So I think it's, it's getting it done fast enough. I don't think it's a fundamental issue. And, and were they the right people to basically, right? I mean, like I said, the, the things that are required to do process engineering and development, right, to basically enable a solution process may not be the the same set of skills that is required to basically demonstrate the lab sell at you know seven, eight, ten percent, and you know. Yeah, well, you, 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 one thing I think uh, uh, it's probably related to technology, your 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 selection of your technology. I think uh, Kanaka, if you think of Kanaka, if you want to do everything in in, in this uh, solution process, I think the the electrodes there uh, produce a, a lot of. Uh, um, to say uh, a, a, a lot of headache for them. That's my, my feeling. And uh, on the other hand, if you you might have a hybrid approach. That uh, uh, if you think about one, uh, for example, your, your last uh, your last electrode. If I want to get aluminum, and uh, then if you think about potato chips, those, those aluminum, those are a very uh, how to say that's a, uh, that's, that's a very um, fast process. And you do not really need a high vacuum, very high vacuum for that process. That makes a difference. Okay. And uh, you, I mean, you go to, if you go to uh, OLED, multi-layer OLED, uh, then it's very sensitive. That uh, you, your vacuum level have to be high. And uh, in that part, uh, maybe maybe a hybrid is, is one way for, for you to to get the solution process uh, things going. So you're advocating the first niche application would be covering potato bags with organic. 
Yes, you could have, <laughs> yes, you could have lighting, light, lit banners eat me. Right? <laughs> <laughs> that would have to be on the inside. That's where the aluminium is. That's not going to work, guys. Details, details. I'm sure there's a that's, business model. That's a product developer worry about that. Yeah. <laughs> so I think it is getting quite late, and I think I'll wrap up this discussion at this point. So well, let's thank the panel for donating your time. And And these fine gentlemen